check one, two. Hey, good evening, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome to Emanate. We're so glad you guys are here with us. We are going to kick off this evening in worship together. So why don't we all stand? Tonight we have Matt and our awesome worship team leading us. We have plenty of space up here in the front or in the back. You're welcome to spread out if you'd like during worship and just hang out in God's presence together. Just make yourself at home. All right, let's pray. God, you're so good. Thank you, Lord, that you're here with us. Lord, we enjoy you. Lord, we recognize, we recognize you tonight. Lord, we fix our gaze on you. Would you increase our sensitivity to you? And we just say, Holy Spirit, would you come and just have your way in us? Have your way during this time tonight. We love you so much and we're so glad that, that you're here. So we just bless you and we honor you and we worship you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. to join the song sung long before our lives to raise our voice along heaven and earth alike we've seen your faithful Come to join the song. We've come to join the song. So long before our lives to raise our voice along heaven and earth alike. We've seen your faithful hand. We've seen your faithful hand, your mercy without end, the King who bled and died, the God who sacrificed. Be enthroned upon the praises of the thousand
slain and risen King. We lift our voice to heaven, sing it worthy, Lord of all. you the Lord of all. Sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Are you King? Sing holy, 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 holy. Sing holy, holy, holy. Are you king? Oh, sing holy, 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 holy. Oh, King, King Jesus, we sing holy.
I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. So I'm laying down.
simple gospel, I will rejoice in you, Lord. I will rejoice in the simple gospel, and I will rejoice in you, Lord. I will rejoice in the simple gospel. I will rejoice in you, Lord. I will rejoice in the simple gospel. I will
green breath that's in my lungs. My heart cries out to you belongs the glory. Through every loss or victory, my soul will rise to only bring you glory. With every breath, with every breath that's in my lungs, my heart cries out to you belongs the glory. Through every loss of victory, my soul Thank you. 
Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love your presence. Lord, we say that there's no one like you. Thank you so much for your faithful, faithful, faithful love for us, your children, God. Lord, that even before time began, God, you chose us to be in Christ through what Jesus would do for us on the cross, through his shed blood. Lord, you put us in yourself, Lord, and because of that, you call us worthy and blameless. Lord, and now we stand before you, we're covered in your love. Lord, we say you're so amazing and you're so worthy and you are faithful. Lord, and there's no one like you. <laughs> You're so good. You're so good. You're so good, God. Lord, I thank you that your kingdom is one that cannot and will not ever be shaken. You are an unshakable God. Lord, your word stands true forever. Lord, your love passes through the generations forever. <laughs> you are an eternal God. You are before time and you will be there in eternity, Lord. And so we worship you tonight as our eternal, faithful, worthy, and holy God. Lord, we recognize your presence here with us. Lord, we say that we love you. We love you, God, our King, our friend who chose us, who knows us by name. Wow, we love you, Lord. <laughs> We love you. You're the one who first loved us. God, we worship you tonight. We say you are holy and you're worthy of our time. You're worthy of our affection. And we fix our eyes on you tonight, Jesus. Author and perfecter of our faith. You are beautiful. You are worthy, God. You are holy. But we love your presence. We keep coming, Holy Spirit. You increase our sensitivity, Lord. Make us more aware of you than we have been ever before. Thank you, Lord, that you never leave our side. You're our constant companion. <laughs> You're good. Thank you for being such a good father. So we honor you tonight, Lord. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Name above all names. Desire of the nations, Jesus, we love you. Wow. Thank you for blessing us with your time and your presence, God. We love you. And we thank you. Can you just thank him tonight for his closeness? <laughs> worship you, Jesus. You're so good. You're so amazing. Can we thank our amazing worship team as well, guys? Thank you guys so much. You guys are awesome. All right, well, say hello to someone as you guys find your way back to your seats. You can give someone a side hug, high five. You can introduce yourself if you haven't met them before. Find out how long they've been coming to emanate. We'll continue here in just a minute.
Hey guys, can we give our worship team another big round of applause? Thank you guys so much. Bless you. All right, well, hey guys, welcome to Emanate. My name is Michelle. I'm on the pastoral team here at Grace Center. It's so good to see you guys. I love being here on Mondays. This is a place to be, and we're so glad that you've chosen to spend this evening together with each other and in God's presence. Isn't God good? Amen. Yes, he's so good. All right, it's, if it's your first time here, I want to give you a special welcome. Also, shout out to everyone tuning in online. It's great to have you guys with us. All right, well, guys, who is excited about our next portion of this evening? We get to continue our worship, yes, by bringing our tithes and offerings together. So there's three ways that you can give. If you guys are writing a check, you can write it out to Grace Center. If you guys would like to track your giving and you're giving with cash, you can wave and one of our awesome ushers will bring you an envelope. Also, you can give through our PushPay app, which you can download from the App Store. All right, guys. So as I was thinking and praying about our tithes and our offerings tonight, I was just reminded of the faithfulness of God. And I think that when we bring our tithe, so it's our first fruits, right? It's our 10% that actually belongs to the Lord. When we are faithful to bring that to him, it's actually a declaration of faith to say, God, I trust you with my 90%. And I thank you that you have saved me and set me free. And I want to steward everything that you've given me. And now let my life say thank you. And we are sowing this into the kingdom of God, which is a very powerful act in the spirit. Amen. All right, so we're going to speak life, and we're going to declare as we give. So why don't we all stand, and we are going to read our declaration together. Here we go. As we receive tonight's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales, tips and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decreased, blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our financial needs that we may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs> all right. Amen. I love that energy in the room. You guys are awesome. I'm going to get some water. Get the water. Thank you to our awesome ushers. You guys are great. All right, well, we have four announcements for you guys tonight. Actually, three and then a little something. All right, number one, this first thing. Okay, so this is a few weeks out, but I just want to plant a seed tonight. If you are a believer and you would like to be water baptized... <laughs> We are going to be hosting a baptism service at Grace Center here on Sunday, February 4th, which is my birthday. Woo! Hello! <laughs> it's going to be during second service. Um, so if you were baptized as a kid or if you've recently gotten saved or if you've rededicated your life to Jesus and you would like to go for the full plunge, that's what we're going to be doing. We have an awesome dunk tank up here. But if you... I mean, as I'm talking, if something is lighting up in you, I would say pay attention to that, okay? Pray about it. If you're interested, there's going to be a baptism class the morning of. You can get all of the information and register online at gracecenter.us. There's also a link on our Emanate website at emanate.me. All right, number two. Everyone say number two. Number two. Number two. We launched our Wednesday night classes this past week, which were super fun. There is still time to hop in on our classes if you hop on this week. So we are hosting three options. Our first class is prophetic training with our very own Danielle Helson. Um, this goes through the biblical foundations of prophetic ministry. There are tons of hands-on activations, which are super fun and great practice. If you want to grow in hearing God's voice and sharing his heart with others, really encourage you to come to this. Our second class that we have is Discovering Your Purpose with Tony Wakefield. This is a crash course in helping us learn who we are, how God built us, and if you're wondering what to be when you grow up, come and listen to Tony, because he has like decades of experience in this. Um, we're going through 48 Days to the Work You Love with Dan Miller, and it is 
So awesome. Number three is Life Languages with Allison Hendrickson. So we are going to be learning all about our communication filters, how we perceive information. You're going to find out like a huge profile about how you're wired and going through the intricacies of all of those things. So head online. Everything's going to be happening here. It's every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We would love to have you. And you can register at emanate.me. All right. Everyone say number three. Number three. All right. Our Grace Center men's meeting, our first meeting, your guys, first meeting of 2018 is this Sunday at 5 p.m. right here in this room. And to share more, can you guys help me welcome up? This is Mari Armstrong. It's one of our dads of the house. <laughs> All right, so Mari's on our, oh, look at this. You're so loved. We love you. you. So this is a dad of the house, and I just want to give space for him to share more, okay? Yeah. Thanks. Wow. I feel so honored. Thank you. Uh, well, you took half of it. That's great. I, I'm not here to tell you that there's a meeting next week. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Lord started laying on, on my heart a thing that I, I talked with Jeff and our leadership team about. And the Lord said, why don't you call up Michelle and ask her if you can share this. So she was gracious enough to let me come up here. I want to talk to you guys about why to come to the men's meeting. This isn't because we need bodies. It's for, for two years, we've done nothing but get more solid and grow, and it's been great. But it's about the kingdom. And um, there are two reasons that the Lord started, that he said, this is why I want you all to do this. One is, we need you guys. Not because we need your body. Uh, that's kind of strange saying in church, I'm sure. <laughs> But, you know, Jeff's been taught, Jeff was in Romans this week, and he was talking about the progress, the process of moving towards hope. And it's also the same process of moving towards maturity. And in that is character. And character, the Greek word for it is experience. And so for us, you need to come to us because guess what? You're going to be going through the trials we've already traveled. We have experience in that. We've already been single guys trying to find a mate. We've already gone through the nervousness of dating and proposing and wrestling marriage and fatherhood and all those things and all the pitfalls with it. So you're not alone. Those of you that are married in here and thinking, did I really screw this up? We've been there with you. We've been through the doubts and through the times where we've asked the Lord, where are you? So one of the biggest things we've learned is that guys go through the same experiences so you need us because we have things to share with you to help you navigate the things the Lord's going to take you through in the coming years. The second thing is we need you. So some of us, as you can tell, are a little long in the tooth. Um, my kids are older than some of you all, and that's, that's okay. I, I still need my Wheaties and all that. But you guys have zeal and uh, some Lord was saying to me this morning is experience often gets in the way of my meekness. So meekness is simply uh, a gentle, it, it's like a horse. Horse is powerful and strong, but you put, you train a horse and put reins on them, they obey the one who has the reins. That's what meekness is. And that's what I want to be. And I hope that's what you want to be is I want the father to control everything I do, but my experience sometimes gets in the way. And I go, I've done that before. It, that doesn't work that way. And when I'm hiring employees, one of the biggest things I look for in an employee is someone who's not afraid to do something. And you guys aren't afraid. And so we need your boldness, if you will, to temper our, oh, we've tried that. It doesn't work. That's not how God works. He does it his way. So um, because we know better, right? So we need you for that. So that's, that's what I wanted to communicate to the guys here is that come because you need us and we need you. And there's a purpose to this, is that we want to be a part of the kingdom moving. And we want to be a part of it, not run over by it, if you will. So over the last two years, we've seen men get healthy and be ready for the things that God has for them to do. And that's what I'd like to invite you to do with us next week. Thank you, Mari. All right, so men, you can see all the details and you can RSVP online at emanate.me.
Thanks so much for being with us, Mari. It's so, so good. All right. Now, last but not least, today is a special day. January 15th is the anniversary of our dearly loved Alan and AJ Jones, everyone. <laughs> yes! <laughs> you guys are amazing. So, guys, these guys have been married for 13 years today, okay? 13 years. If you guys see Alan and AJ, like, Thank them for who, the, like, bless them, give them money. Um, guys, I just want to honor you and thank you for choosing the Lord and choosing each other day in and day out, because all of us have been blessed by that. And so, oh, we just love you guys. You're such a gift. Can we stretch out our hands and just bless them? So, Father, thank you so much for Alan and AJ. Lord, we bless them for a life and a life abundant even more of your kindness, more of your goodness, deeper experiences of your love in their marriage, in their lives. Lord, would you just bless them out of their socks for all the decades to come? We're so thankful for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you. All right, well, we have a special treat tonight. It's like all the special things tonight. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so we are super honored to have our friend Dan Fairley in the house, everyone. We are... So excited that you're here with us. Dan is all the way here from Redding, California. He's been in senior leadership at Bethel. He's on the pastoral team. He's the dean of the School of Supernatural Ministry there. And since 1992, right? 91? That's like 27 years this year. I did the math. That's amazing. So, Dan, as I was thinking about you, I was like, I can see this longevity. And I just want to honor you tonight for your faithfulness to God and to your family. The Lord sees you. He sees the sacrifices that you've made in the secret place. And I almost see like this miner who, who just like digs out the deep things of God. And, and he loves to share his riches with you and his treasure with you. And you just have this big perspective that we, I think we all really like admire and respect. So we always look forward to you coming and being with us. So can you guys please help me welcome Dan Fairley. Beautiful, thanks. Hello. How are you? Are you doing good? It is good to be with you guys. I, I like this shorter pulpit. I feel, the other one feels like I'm hiding behind, like I'm going to do a puppet show. Hello, wait a minute. <laughs> Hi-ho, Kermit the Frog. Okay, so anyway, uh. That was pretty good, Kermit. Yeah, I played I played Kermit for a short time during summer camp, but uh, I was painted green, wearing a trench coat, and uh, anyway, you had to see Sesame Street to get it. So uh, some of you are a bit maybe a little young for that. Uh, it, it is really good to be with you. I I have a sense of what I'm going to be talking to you about tonight, but I don't know for sure what I'm going to be talking about tonight. And um, uh, today is a very important day. I uh, the anniversary is absolutely important. I saw we saw a better picture earlier today from their wedding day, uh, just so you know. So uh, the, the young couple was there and a uh, little red cape on. Yes, very nice. So uh, make sure you get a chance to see that. That's a good pick. <laughs> but I'm going to uh, pray for me and then pray for you. And, uh, and we might pray some more tonight uh, as we go through. So it might, could be quite a bit of prayer. So let's see how this goes, all right? <laughs> Uh, Heavenly Father, we, every good gift comes from you, and you have made us in your image and then rescued us, remade us in your image, and then you are socializing us. You are teaching us your ways. As a good father, a good mother, you say, this is how, this is how we behave in, in our house. This is how we do things. This is how we see things. This is how we think. I ask for a grace to be in this room, a grace. And then... Um, I'm just going to pray, Lord Jesus, we do, I ask that uh, no weapon of the enemy formed against us would prosper tonight, and that we raise the shield of faith against the fiery darts of accusation and lies that the enemy would seek to throw into our minds and our heart, and I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would loose the harmony, the love, and the joy of the gospel in this room tonight. 
Grace, 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 in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good, well, um, when I heard that I was going to be coming uh, today and I get a chance to speak to you on the day we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King, I was very excited about that. I've been on a journey of trying to grow in my capacity as a father and as somebody who can speak on behalf of uh, racial harmony and equality and justice and kind of trying to find my way as I'm speaking about these things. One of the, one of the joys about, uh, I think it was last year on Dr. Martin Luther King's day, they sent my 10-year-old son home with a record album of the I Have a Dream speech, the whole one from his school, and I got a chance to listen to the whole speech and just hear this beautiful challenge to America, to hear uh, this, I believe, a prophet. Now, a lot of us don't think prophets and apostles are for today, and I do think that apostles and prophets are for today, and I think Dr. King was a prophet calling out the gold in America, calling out who, gold, uh, who America could be, what he could see would happen. The I Have a Dream portion of his speech Again, full of vision, but he also has another that's full of difficult truths that is in that same sermon. We kind of, you know, gravitate towards, I have a dream, but he's talking about the difficulty of, of African-American people not being able to get housing on their way to that march. And so um, I, maybe we'll get a chance to, to listen to that, but I've been on this journey of like saying, okay, how are we going to move forward from here? And... Um, you know, I had a young lady in our congregation. Let me just explain a little bit about, like, I grew up in San Francisco, very uh, racially uh, diverse environment. My church had uh, Hispanics and Asians, Native Americans in the church. We had them in our church uh, as far as leadership and as also fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So I kind of grew up with a real ah, plethora of uh, different people, uh, nationalities, kind of in our environment. And and so I left there, and I went down to Los Angeles, and I, I lived there. And then I moved to Redding. Redding's super white. Uh, Redding, uh, Redding's like, we've got a lot of white people in Redding. So it's mo mostly white people. Like, I, I remember moving there and having culture shock. Like, oh, my God, I didn't know. I've never been. I'd never been in an environment with this many white people before. <laughs> Being from San Francisco in, in L.A. So I, I'm like, it was a weird, I, you know, it like, and we told the same story. Like, I found the Hmong. Uh, these were kind of uh, from around the area of Laos and Cambodia. I found some Hmong people. I'm like, hello. I, <laughs> I just, like, how are you doing? So, so that was kind of my upbringing. But, but I've been up there in, in Reading for quite a while now. And um, just uh, being with the School of Supernatural Ministry, so I'm the dean. We have about 2,300 students there. And um, it's great. So the church is about 7,000 and about 2,300 students. So in this in this little town. And it's interesting the impact we're having on Reading because almost most of the minorities that are in Reading are there because of the school. And most of the internationals that are in Reading are there so that if you're at Trader Joe's and somebody hears a you know, Swiss accent, they're like, you go to Bethel, don't you? Uh, so uh, it's kind of, and there's, if you think about the numbers, we're about 9,000 people in a city of 100,000. So we've got, we got some interesting dynamics happening in our, in, in our environment there. So I'm with, um, oh, I've, been, I've been teaching on brave communication. That's generally when I come and teach on brave communication. So how many of you have heard that talk from me before, either today or before? Okay, good, so a lot of you. So some of the big ideas there are that we, uh, the, probably the biggest idea is in communication is that content is not as important as connection. And the emotional world we have with each other is the primary way we make connection. So when I just argue with about content and miss your emotion, I really haven't connected with you. And so it involves these skills of really listening, really listening, knowing what's going on with your own heart so you're able to share. And so I have like a simple phrase. It's can you, can you hear their heart? Can you, can you share your own heart? Because some of us don't know what's in our own heart. Um, like right now, because I'm bringing up race, some of your, your anxiety meters <laughs> pegged. I don't know if you know it, but it's pegged. You're feeling like, what's I going to say? As I was doing a service, and a guy stood up and said, listen, I'm not prejudiced, but, like, right there, I'm like, I want to grab the microphone out of his, like, because you never know what thing is going to be said right after that phrase. Uh, right after that phrase. Yeah. <laughs> so I've stood, it was at a funeral, I'm like, hey, brother, brother, get rid of that, snag it, they got of his, out of his hands.
You should, anytime you have to say, my, my relative's not prejudiced, but like you should, that should be a warning bell about what's about, to, what's about to come out of somebody's mouth. So, um, so can, you hear, can you share your heart? Can you hear their heart, heart? And can you create a new normal? Can you create a new normal? And so, you know, we've been in discussion as a nation trying to, I feel like, not hear each other's heart not listen with generous ears, not listen to connect to each other, to appreciate the insight we can gain from each other, not knowing our own heart other than a bunch of uh, defensiveness and concern, and then so really not really working as a nation to create a new normal. So I've been in this journey, and like I said, I don't have notes tonight, so you're going to have to be listening. I hope you trust me, and if I say something goofy, if you're a minority and I say something goofy, please talk to me afterwards, you know, like, that hurt. Don't do that again, and uh, that'll be good. That'll be good for me. And if I scare you, I'll stick around a little bit to, to talk and spend some time because I'm going to talk about some difficult stuff. And just hear me. I do think there is a demonic assault against the harmony of the races. I don't think racism is merely a human problem, although it is a human problem. But the enemy is also fanning the flame of racism. And when, in Ephesians, we read about the principalities and the powers. And I think there's a power at work in this that's keeping us from being able to hear and move forward and enjoy each other. Can you hear your heart? Can you hear their heart? Can you share your heart? Can you create a new normal? So I'm, um, of all the things that happened, some of the, uh, diffi- some of the, um, uh, you know, painful riots that were going on, some of the, uh, the, the interactions with police that were difficult, boy, that's caused a lot of, of pain and difficulty in our student body. And so we're, um, several of the, the African-American students, the black students, the Hispanic students said, hey, Dan, can we meet with you as the dean and kind of talk with you about what, how we're experiencing Bethel, you know, how we're experiencing BSSM. And so I'm like, yeah, tell me, you know, come and, come and talk to me. And so uh, it was very powerful for them to be able to say, this is, this is what it's like being black in, in, in the school. This is what it's like when something really gigantic happens where somebody's killed and uh, who's involved with the police or there's some riot, and we don't hear anything from you guys. Oh, that was a tough message, you know. So, you know, we're talking uh, with each other, and I... Uh, I probably heard the word, um, it was said with humility and said with honor. So they, the students did a great job. But I probably heard that um, the word ignorant roughly applied to me. <laughs> I'm not used to being called ignorant. You know, I'm 52 and, I, you know, I've got some, I'm not used to being called ignorant. But it was so interesting as, I'm, as they're sharing, as I'm talking, and just this general idea of ignorance is going around. And, and I, I began to go like, Oh, it was a trigger word for me. Like, ignorant, I'm brilliant. Have you met me? Like, like what? I, you know, that I'm super nice. I love harmony. I love the gospel. And you're like, ah, but, but as it, they talked more and more, I went, um, ignorant's probably the best word. Because some of my silence is not about uh, a vindictiveness or meanness. Some of it's about fear. Like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to be some white dude fixing the problem for the Hispanic community or the Asian community because that makes it even worse. Like, here I am, the white guy. We'll fix this. That, that drives everybody nuts. So, so, I'm ignorant. So, inviting these relationships, these students, I said, will you come back? Will you keep giving me feedback about how you're experiencing this environment? And I would ask questions like, I... It feels weird. Like, I don't want to, you know, talk to, uh, you know, black members of Bethel Church and go, hey, how are you experiencing Bethel? Are you doing good? Are people treating you good? I mean, like, I don't want to single people out that way. I didn't grow up in a church like that. And they're like, I don't know why you wouldn't check in with us. I'm like, well, would you check in with other people? I'm like, yeah. Would you? And I'm like, oh, okay. So, uh, all right. And so they're, um, and then one of the young ladies is powerfully talking about the trauma she's experienced from racism. And I, and I'm ignorant. Because I haven't experienced racism. So I'm thinking to myself, the dumbest dumb idea I've ever, I've had a lot of dumb ideas, but this one's super dumb, right? So it it dawns on me, of course, as she's talking, I'm like, I don't think I've ever put trauma and racism or prejudice together. I don't know if it, however, they just never got wired up that experiencing racism and prejudice is a traumatic experience. And partly... From being white and um, and uh, which is the majority culture, I'm probably gonna use some buzzwords. I'll probably mention Colin Kaepernick today. So if you just get ready, don't get uh, 
Don't get too anxious. Uh, <laughs> through, uh, what was I saying before? Colin Kaepernick, he made me nervous. I'm kidding. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> thank you for yelling white guy from the front. That's not helping. <laughs> white guy. <laughs> like, in fact, yes, monochromatic. You know, I was like, it's just a singularly white guy with blue eyes. Yeah, so, um, the, the trauma, yeah, there's just, the, just the, the trauma and thinking, man, I hadn't quite wired that up, you know, and what else don't I know? And so, very interesting to kind of say, hey, tell me more, right? Not, well, here's the reason we didn't do that, but tell me more. Then what happened? And what was that like for you? You know, it's, it's, in, it's been, you know, an education because I was kind of ignorant. I don't know exactly, there's probably reasons for it. Partly, I grew up in a decently healthy place with not a ton of of racism going on in my particular environment. We had a multicultural environment. So I think I universalized my experience. I kind of went, since I'm not a racist and I didn't grow up with a bunch of racists, there mu racism must not be that big a deal, right? No, of course it is. But I mean, I think that, that universalizing my experience, that's what I was gonna talk about. Listen, I, I, we're trigger words. Being called ignorant, totally trigger. I'm like having to go like, okay, nobody's trying to hurt your feelings, Dan. They're not throwing a rock at you. You're gonna be okay. Gonna be okay, Dan. You're you know, like, uh, <laughs> but you know, the idea of white privilege is another like. Oh, I didn't understand white privilege. So I began to be able to hear a little bit more as I listened more and leaned in. I went, okay, it's white privilege. That's what. How about if I if I experience that as the majority culture, which happens to be white culture in America. The majority culture. So again, white privilege hurts my heart a little bit. It feels like fighting words. You know, I don't mean them to be, but that's how they hit me. But when I'm like, well, here's what we mean by that. Be like, oh, oh, when you're the majority culture, which happens to be white in America, you don't think about what's going to happen when you're stopped by the police. When you're the majority culture. If you were in China and you were stopped by the police there and you were Chinese, you wouldn't be thinking like, uh, what's going to happen here? But, but I've, been in, I've been in Mexico on mission trip, stopped by the Hispanic, by, by, by the federales there. And you're like, how's this going to go? I'm the minority culture in a majority, a different culture. And so as I began to kind of think, okay, now I'm hearing the students. I'm hearing my students talk to me a little bit more about what this is like. And I've, I've got a new mindset of just like, okay, majority culture. So um, Brian Loritz, in one of his books, he talks about, listen, when, when you're the majority culture, you never have to think about, like, how am I going to fit in in that environment? Or you rarely have to think. You really have to think, how am I going to fit in? Um, am I going to be overlooked for this position because of the color of my skin or my ethnicity? Uh, is this, am I going to just run into stares from people of rejection just based on, you know, the, the color of my skin? But majority culture, we never really think about those things. In fact, the majority culture, wherever you are, if you're in Europe or you're somewhere else, if you're, uh, you know, if you're Germans in Germany, you're kind of the majority culture, you know, that you don't have to think about, um, uh, how do I adapt? You, in other words, put it this way, I never have to think about how I'll fit in to the culture, but if you're a minority in a majority culture, you're constantly thinking, how am I going to fit in? One of my friends, uh, who's a, a black man from England who pastors with me, we we're talking about somebody, we're on retreat, and it's all of my team, these are all pastors, and they gently say to each other, you're like, phew, it's good to get away from the media storm of all the drama in the media. And Galibe uh, says, who's, you know, he's black and uh, from England, he says, what do you mean the media storm? He's like, oh, all that talk about just, you know, race and Trump. And he's like, so you you're, you're think we're going to go on a retreat and get away from that? <laughs> he's like, in my world, you never get away from that. You don't, you don't take a retreat and get away from that. I'm like, oh, can you hear their heart? Can you hear their heart? When I'm at Azusa, and uh, Azusa now, there's 50,000 evangelicals there and a uh, powerful preacher. Uh, he says, when you talk, when you hear about Black Lives Matter, can you, can you ignore, this is kind of my words, can you ignore the content and hear the heart of the cry of the young black man for justice? Can you ignore the, the rhetoric and hear the heart of their cry for justice and weeping over injustice? Like, oh, yeah, I can hear that. I want to hear that. 
These are my brothers and sisters in Christ. So just been on a journey kind of hearing from the, the students. And, and it's interesting. There's an old, there's an old, um, oh, I feel like I'm telling you too much truth today or um, personal truth today. So a- around the time that my fellow pastors, Danny and um, uh, Danny Soak and Chris Vallotton were writing books about women being empowered in ministry. And as you read the New Testament, it is a bit confusing about what belongs in the then and there of Scripture. Should women not talk in church? These sorts of things, which there's some scriptures about these things. Like, well, how do we properly interpret them from the then and there and into the here and now? And, and I was kind of like, I kind of stood in the back and let those guys go forward. I don't know why exactly. Did I, I have a high need for harmony. I don't, I don't like conflict. I want to get along with people. And somehow or another, I thought, well, the Bible, you could interpret the Bible both ways. Like, you know, really, just, you know, I can understand why some of my conservative brothers are a little bit. Uh, uh, uh. So this is embarrassing and sh- feels a little shameful to me. But I stood on the sidelines while my other brothers were exploring what does the Scripture truly say about women being empowered in ministry. And, and Sherry Silk said to me, at, in a time of personal conversation in our office, she with me and said, Dan, I don't understand why you haven't moved forward and written this book yourself. Like, why you haven't, the Bible guy hasn't come out and said, this is how the Bible should be properly interpreted in this area. And I'm like, uh, 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 uh. I was scared. Because I'd do it wrong. I wouldn't say the right things. So here, this, another opportunity comes up. And you're like, will I operate in fear again? Will I... Be afraid I'll do it wrong or say it wrong, which, of course, I will, and hopefully there'll be enough love in the environment to have correction come my way, to be uh, uh, less ignorant, (laughs) Uh, to have a two-way communication, not just one way, but two-way communication. And so, you know, we're on this journey, you know, and then as I'm talking to the black students and I've got, I've got the Hispanic students and the Asian students who are like, hey, this racism isn't just black and white. Like, I, I know, I know. I know it's not there either. Our Native and American brothers and sisters, like, oh, yeah, yeah. We want to talk, talk with you guys as well. And so we are on this journey of really figuring out how to be fully loving towards each other, fully respectful each other, and fully calling out the gold and the transformation in each other. And listen, the church of Jesus Christ is uniquely equipped to love each other, to respect each other. So I was talking about to, uh, so Galibe, the same guy, and we, he and I were teaching a class on, um, on ethnicity and, and, uh, uh, and, and unity and justice. And so we were kind of team teaching this class. And so, I, you know, I was talking to him and said, you know, I'm really thankful for Black Lives Matter. I'm really thankful for Colin Kaepernick because I'm a San Francisco 49er fan. You know, he's doing this. I'm like, I wouldn't be having these conversations unless enough uncomfortableness was caused in my environment to have these conversations. Like, I need the activist because I'll just let status quo be. I'm kind of conservative. I conserve the status quo. That's kind of what conservatives do. We conserve the status quo. Like, is it really that bad? Are we really? Look, a little changes here and there. So, man, the activist, I need them. I need the agitator. I'm not sure I can go all the way. Sometimes the rhetoric of the activist is like, I can't go there. Or, boy, some of that doesn't make sense or it kind of breaks down. But, you know what, like activists always are taking it to the very edge to kind of pull the rest of us along in a little bit of a wake. We we do this at Bethel with healing. Everybody gets healed. Let's pray hand, lay hands on everybody. And you're like, you know, God wants to heal every single person. You're like, we're activating like that. And people are like, everybody, Dan? What what about Job? You know, all that sort of stuff that happens. Uh, Yeah. So, like... Activists, they take that envelope way out there, but by taking it out there, they kind of pull a bunch of us in their gravity. It's kind of, and so instead of like getting frustrated at the activists out there, so I say this to Galibe, like, I'm, I need those guys. Like, I, you know, some of the, what they're saying hurts my heart or breaks my brain, or I don't think, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one thing. Listen, I don't think shame motivates people. I don't think shame motivates people. It's ultimately not a great motivator. And, 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 and likewise, Sometimes we'll say to the, to the activists, like, um, we'll say the activists, well, tell me what you want it to look like. We can, you know, give me a vision for what it looks like. And it's like, well, it's tough to do vision with people who are in pain. You can't vision people out of pain. 
sometimes as the majority culture, we're like, okay, okay, we get it. It's not working good. What do you want it to look like? What, what, come on, what are we going to do? It's like, no, it's going to take some time. Can you hear their heart? Can you hear the heart of the, the immigrant? Can you hear the heart of the Hispanic, the Asian, the black, the Native American? Can you hear their heart? Before you go, oh, we'll fix it. And we'll, we'll vision you out of it. So there's a season for vision, but sometimes there's a season of listening beforehand. So Galibe says, uh, I say, hey, I really need the activist. Because I'd be stuck without me, me go, hmm, you're kneeling at the anthem again. <laughs> Uh, and then all my other friends, like, you know, it's over. I'm having conversations with people over dinner, and I'm saying to people, like, listen, we would not be having this conversation if Colin wasn't kneeling. It, and I don't know what you want as far as a nonviolent protest. Yeah, but I, yeah, I get it. It's, it's kind of working. At least it worked on this guy. So I say this to Galibe, and Galibe says to me, I don't think we would need the activist if the church would be the church. <laughs> so, so, so Galibe just, uh, I think I'm saying this enlightened, interesting, white person thing to say, like, oh, yes, uh, I think we need the activists, and I like Colin. And Galibe just goes, well, the church should be doing this, should be doing this, and hasn't been doing this. And so, and he hit it right on the head. You know, in Brian Lawrence's book, he says that only 2.5% of the Christian churches in America are, uh, are, are, are uh, racially mixed, are diverse. And by that, he defines it as at least 20% of our leadership and our congregation is of a, uh, a, a, a minority other than the, the majority, which happens to be white culture here in America. If we were somewhere else, it would be majority Hispanic culture or Asian culture. But if you define diversity as 20% of our people are not from the majority culture, then only 2.5% of congregations are. And listen, that's not because of segre uh, segregation law anymore. We are self-segregating. Through preference, you know, through, through the majority culture, like not realizing, like if we had our brothers and sisters of color in here say, hey, these are some of the hurdles I had to step through to come into this environment and thrive, you'd probably be surprised by some of the hurdles that they've stepped through that you don't experience as hurdles at all. It's just part of it. It's no shame in that. It's just that as a majority culture, you generally aren't aware of those things. They're super normal for you. So I'm talking to our African-American students. They're like, well, Bethel worship's okay. We're like, okay, the world loves Bethel worship. But I'm like, uh, they're like, well, there's, not, there's not a lot of, you know, we like all sorts of music. <laughs> <laughs> rather than, you know, whatever that is that Bethel plays. I don't know. <laughs> four rocks, I don't know, four guitars, and a, I don't know what we're playing. Uh, what is that? What is it? Four rocks. It's not four rocks, but <laughs> that was going to be something. You shut up. No, shush. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, the church needs to be the church. And so I, I want to talk to you just real quickly about some, uh, you know, some scripture on this. And if, if scripture was a little bit like, hey, how are we going to empower women when Paul says women don't talk in the church or that sort of thing? Like, um, what, you know, and part of the Christian, there are 2.2 billion Christians running around the planet. Just so you realize that. You're like, you're not part of this tiny breed or whatever else. You are probably the biggest you're part of when you have the Catholics and the Orthodox, the biggest movement on the planet are Christians. Of course, the enemy tries to act like, you're losing! It's gone! It's all going to hell! And you're like, there's 2.2 billion of us. And so, uh, what was I saying? Something about four rocks. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> so I don't have notes, really, so I'm like, ah, this is the problem with me and not having notes. So if it's, if it's a little unclear about women, and it, but it's getting much clearer. Don't give me, I don't think it's unclear anymore, but it took some time to sit with the scripture and to figure out like how does, what stays in the then and there and what comes into the here and now? And what has, what has the gospel liberated that had to be bound within that patriarchal society? And so these are some of the questions you think about as an interpreter. Everybody's a Bible interpreter. Here, listen to this. Even biblical literate people are interpreters. It happens all the time. Like, you think you're, you're treating it little, really literally until you realize, no, I'm not. 
<laughs> or somebody else usually points it out to you. So, um, but about, about our identity, about that we are all one in Christ, Scripture is unequivocally clear. This was very interesting to me. Like, and I don't have quite an answer for this, but I, and this is, I might, uh, I don't think pride is a healthy way to motivate uh, communities to change. White pride, black pride, Asian pride. But when you don't have the gospel, you end up reaching for pride. So I understand why the world has tried to say, we need you to take ownership of who you are and love who you are. I'm like, I, I look, that's, that's good. Ownership and loving who you are is good. But when we step into pride, I don't think pride will take us where we need to go. Any sort of pride. In fact, Paul continues like, if you think you've got a reason to have pride, I have more reason to have pride than the rest of you. But I count it rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. So in the New Testament, the Lord notices different cultures and celebrates them. Just so we, we're clear about this. It's, he's not trying to homogenize all the cultures into one super quasi-white American, you know, uh, sort of deal. He's not trying to homogenize them all. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit's poured out on a bunch of Jews who have, they're ethnically Jews, but they have culture from, a different, from different places they've lived, Parthian and Crete. But these, these aren't totally culturized by Parthians and Cretes and the Crete and all these other places. They've actually are religious Jews because they've traveled to come back and observe Pentecost. So, yeah, this, the Holy Spirit's being poured out on Jewish, ethnically Jewish people who are kind of multicultural um, and, and yet are still ob observant Jews are, are uh, observing in that whole deal. So, we have an interesting talk that I'm even learning more about, and I don't know a ton about this, but it's this interesting discussion about, about somebody's ethnicity and their culture. I can't unpack this a ton. But I think in Scripture you see uh, Paul is working with the Jews because the Jews are like, listen, we are, we are God's people. We are the Jews. Like, isn't there anything special about being a Jew? He's like, no. <laughs> I mean, the Messiah, you know, the promises of Abraham came through you. The Messiah came, you know, through you. You are, and I, I, a phrase I love, you're, uh, you were the womb of the Messiah, that, that, which is beautiful. You know, if we could, if the, if the Irish could have been the womb of the Messiah, that'd be great, you know. Uh. <laughs> Ah, that's racist. The, uh, <laughs> he's made fun of Irish people up here. I so saw the. Uh, <laughs> he's from England. So the. Uh, <laughs> Scotland. Same thing. Engl oh! 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 Take that! <laughs> that's how it's. That's how it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll be reconciled later tonight. Uh, we'll reconcile. <laughs> Let me read to you some scripture as we're talking about this. <laughs> so you guys, you guys know the passage. Okay, I was digging the short podium until this moment, until I'm trying to read. So uh, I'm still loving it. I'm still loving it. I, I still like it better than the puppet show one. So we're good. All right. Uh, there, in Acts chapter 6, I'm going to... I'm going to lick it and touch your Bible. So this is, I had to, bring, I had to borrow a Bible. Sorry, it's anointed. The uh, saliva of a master teacher. All right, good. So <laughs> I don't need these glasses. All right, let's see. All right, I'm going to put the glasses on. So uh, it's the lighting in here. Uh, every year I come, that's the lighting. Yeah. So and, and just real quickly. Just to kind of point out, they are dealing with cultural stuff. Even the early church is dealing with cultural stuff. So they, in, in Acts 6, the Hellenistic Jews, Jewish widows, 
So they point out the Hellenistic Jewish widows. Now, can you, can you do the math real quickly? What ethnicity are these, are these folks? What ethnicity are they? They're Jews. Their heritage, their genetic heritage is Jewish. But their culture is Greek. And so the, the, the New Testament notices, like, hey, these are, these, are some, these, are, these are Jewish folks with us. And they are wondering, like, are we getting missed passed by during the distribution of food because we are Hellenistic Jews and not Jews that live here, you know, are, are from here originally? So they kind of bring this up, and the, the disciples have to do something about it. In chapter 6, let's see if I can find it in this Habakkuk Bible. Oh, yeah, all right, so um, it's so big. Okay, now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the, the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation to the disciples and said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, bre no. Therefore brethren, uh, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit, and of wisdom whom we may put in charge of this task, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Porcus, Nicanor, Timon, not from the Lion King, uh, the uh, <laughs> Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Is there any more? Uh, and these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid hands on them. So they, they even notice, like, this dude is a proselyte from Antioch. So the New Testament isn't devoid of noticing culture and valuing culture. It's not like, I don't, I don't like it. Can, can we all just, you know, just be under one? Can we all just be Christian and just agree on that? Like, no, the New Testament's aware of cultural distinctions and differences. And in Revelation, it says, every tongue and tribe and nation will declare the praises of the Lord. So the Lord kind of loves this diversity, even of our language and of our heritage, of our ethnicity and our culture. In light of that, that's all true. But our society would say, that belongs at the top. And as the church of Jesus, we'd say, no, followers of Christ belong to the top. And my, my culture, my ethnicity is hidden in my identity in Christ. My identity in Christ is the primary place I draw my meaning from. I was watching, um, uh, they were doing, um, it's, it's, that's PBS on Channel 9, or you don't have Channel 9, PBS. It was a story about finding your roots, and it was a, a woman black activist, and she said this, if, I, if you said, if you put a bunch of women in front of me and a bunch of uh, uh, black people in front of me, I, and who do you primarily, she's like, I would just, I would identify primarily with the men and women who are black rather than just women. So it was an interesting thing for her to say, in my self-understanding, my personhood, my experience of being black is dominant, is, is a bigger priority than my experience of being a woman. And it was powerful for me. I'm, as I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to draw strength. I'm like, wow. So I'm like, okay. And I, my deal would be, I get that. I wonder if she was a believer. Because then I would say, the next thing would be like, suppose I had a group of Christians and, and a group of blacks or a group of women. I think the gospel would say, I expect you to identify with Christ, with Christians, primarily. Mm. Some of you right now are going like, I could do it with Christ, but not Christians. <laughs> Jesus is a lot safer than the church, than Christians at some point. So listen to Paul as he talks about this. Um, I'm just trying to think. There, it's all in Acts. It's very interesting. So the very first thing, persecution hits the church. This is probably about three, two or three years, I think, after the Holy Spirit falls on them. There's mostly just Christians. Uh, most of the Christians are Jews at that point who are ethnically Jewish and culturally probably Jewish some. They're still going to temple, but they have some, a little bit of Christian influence. They're also having meetings on Sunday, not just Sabbath, so their culture's evolving. Um, and, and then persecution hits. And so Philip goes down and talks to the Samaritans. And the Samaritans were, were half Jewish, roughly. They were, you know, I don't mean to be offensive what I'm about to say, but the term would be half-breed. It was the derisive term, like you are partially Jewish and partially Gentile, you have no place in the kingdom. 
And then furthermore, they didn't believe in the temple worship in uh, Jerusalem, but at, at Shechem. And, and they were, so, they were, so the Jews didn't like the Samaritans at all. Like they liked Gentiles better than the Samaritans. So the very first place, though, the Lord sends the, the believers is to Samaria. Like, I need you to deal with your religious prejudice. <laughs> I need you to deal with your religious prejudice. And this was the prophecy in Acts chapter 2, that uh, you should be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. So he sends them, he sends Philip down there, and they get, they come to salvation. The apostles and the prophets come and lay hands on them. They receive the Holy Spirit there. And so you're already seeing this, the, the gospel move out of its Jewish confines culturally and ethnically, and now the Samaritans are included. And then pretty soon, the Gentiles are included. And they are having to do, they're having to work out stuff. It's hard. They are, Simon is staying at, uh, Peter is staying at Simon the Tanner's house. Like, Tanner's touch dead animals all day, every day. They, you know, they skin animals and make leather. So uh, you've got Peter is staying in a house of a guy who touches dead things. So he's richly unclean. The Tanner is almost every day of his life. He's richly unclean and can't be involved in temple sort of thing. And Peter's in his house staying there. Peter's having to step over some cultural situations there. And he's kind of starting to get Okay, but this gospel thing means some ad adaptation of my culture. This gospel means I have, to, I have to let go of some things. One of the biggest things they ended up letting go of was circumcision, right? They're talking about like, this is circumcision is the heart of being God's people. But at the Jerusalem Council, they were like, it's circumcision of the heart. It's not circumcision of the body. And they are, they are wrestling as the gospel is transforming culture for them. And so we should have that same expectation that the gospel will continue to transform culture. Continue to transform. So some of the words of Paul that are uh, incredibly important in these areas. I mentioned uh, how explicit these are. Ephesians chapter 2. Just remember Paul. Paul's like a Jewish guy who is who's the prophet to the Gentiles, or, and especially to the diaspora. He would go into the synagogues and, and invite them to know the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then there was a season in his ministry when the synagogues no longer wanted to hear him, like, we're done, we've heard enough of this, and Paul would go into the marketplace. And Paul, if I'm not mistaken, he left the synagogue, and I think it's right next door, and started teaching at Simon's house. Was Simon Tanner too? No, I can't be. Okay, I think I'm getting my Bible stories messed up. So Ephesians chapter 2. He's writing to the Christians in Ephesus. Verse 11. I'm still in Romans. Some of these backup Bibles are tough. It's got two translations in it. So you know how you, pick, you think that's probably this many pages away? It's not. It's double that many pages away. God eats popcorn. If that's where Ephesians is. Okay. That's how I remember Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. All right. So uh, that's how I remember. All right. So you, some of you won't remember any of my talk on race and uh, justice, but it'd be like, God eats popcorn. It's amazing. I use, I use that every day. <laughs> Ephesians. This will take me 10 minutes to find the scripture, just so you know. Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. I'm going to put on the spectacles again. Let's see. Okay. But don't take this any of this for granted. It was uncircum uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were, at that time, separate from Christ. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers in the covenant of promise having no hope and without, the, without God in the world. So he's basically saying you weren't Jewish, you weren't in the covenant, you had no hope. And now he goes on and says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of and its commandments contained in the ordinances, so that in himself, this is Jesus, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man. He might make the Jew and the Gentile into one new man. 
I think by application, we can say, uh, you know, we're all Gentiles. So if the Gentiles and the Jews have been brought in, we are all one new person in Christ. That he might reconcile them both in one body, sorry, uh, to make uh, the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. By it, by the cross, having put to death the enmity between the two. And he came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to our Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building the whole building being fitted and joined together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God by his spirit. And just so you remember, the gospel came out of the Jews who were a tiny minority in the Roman Empire. And they were scattered all throughout. And so the Christians were a tiny minority of the tiny minority of Jews. So the gospel is a minority movement that became the majority movement. The, the gospel came when there was a, another culture sitting on top of it trying to squash it. Uh, the, the culture of the city when it was kind of rural. The culture of the, the, the cultural elites when it came from the backwater of Jerusalem. It, the culture of monotheism, one God versus the culture of many gods. The gospel has this power to kind of, as this tiny mustard seed, grow up and be transformative to the culture that it's planted in. And this culture, Paul is trying to say, is like, so in, in these churches are the oppressed and the oppressor. There's the slave and the master in these churches. They're in these churches. There are Greek supremacists and Jewish supremacists. People who think they are supreme because they're Jewish, people who think they're supreme because they're Greek, and there are Roman supremacists, think they're supreme because they're Romans. They are, so the wealthy are, you know, trying to put up with the poor that are in the church, and vice versa, the poor are trying to put up with the wealthy. So you've got these congregations without a lot of fabric that's really tying them together. And Paul keeps saying to them, you are one in Christ. You're one body. You are a building built together. So in James, when, when, when the, uh, in the, the, the book of James, the letter of James, they try to separate and treat the rich a little different. And James goes, oh, no, no, no. You're not separating on class, based on class. Like, that's not going to happen. So the gospel is constantly pushing us together to work it out. Only in America, we have so many options, we don't get together to work it out. We self-segregate. Knowingly or unknowingly. We avoid conversations, or we, we avoid information, or we, we avoid going to other, uh, you know, other places to have different experiences, exposing our children. And not just like a field trip to another culture, but the people we work with that are of a different, eth a different ethnicity. Paul and the situation is constantly pushing them together, but the, the church in America has figured out how that only 2.5% of us have a diverse congregation. Listen, folks, we have a message for the world. It's a message of our deep love and respect for each other, our capacity to hear and hold each other's pain, to not, to not perpetually live in pain, Nobody wants to perpetually live in pain as much as you're like, well, don't stay a victim. Uh, yeah, nobody wants to say it that way. Uh, there might be a few people who are unhealthy that want to, but generally people don't want to. We want to create a new normal where the justice and the righteousness of the kingdom is available to everyone, that it is transformative to everyone, that in the quality of our relationships and the depth of our affection and the beauty of our interracial or our interethnic relationships, the world can look at them and go, wow, they must be disciples of Jesus. Look how they love one another.
Paul, uh, we're talking about pride. So again, I don't know that pride, I don't know that shame are great motivators. Paul culturally, in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, again, he's, listen, this is interesting, because some of us have tried to, we've, we've tried to wrap up our identity in our culture. And the New Testament is regularly saying, it's not that your culture doesn't matter, it just must be under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Your primary affiliation isn't to, to, to uh, black ethnicity, white ethnicity, Hispanic. Your primary affiliation is to Christ. My primary affiliation is to Christ. It has to kind of be that way. Paul treated culture, his Jewishness, like something he could use or not use, whatever was best for the people he was ministering to. So there are times he would reason from the Torah, and there are other times he would speak from the Greek philosophers. I become all things to all people so as to win them to Christ. Let me read to you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. All right, just uh, stand by. Maybe look at your phone for a minute while I... <laughs> oh, 1 Corinthians 10, we're getting there. Okay, uh, 6. More spit in your Bible. And uh, 9... Verse 19 through 23. For though I am free from all men, would you just think about this as yourself? Would you make this about you? Like, I know it's about Paul, but hear it like it's your declaration about yourself. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that, so that I may win more. To the Jews, I became a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those under the law, as under the law, that though not myself being under the law, so that I might win those who were under the law. To those who are without law, I lived as without law, though not being with one who is without law, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. And to the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things, to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. In the famous passage in Galatians chapter 3 as well, where he says, in Christ there's neither male nor free male, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. So your primary identity, whatever, whatever your ethnicity is, I think it needs to be in Jesus Christ. And let, your, let our culture then flow from that primary lordship of Jesus Christ. In culture, at least the way Paul described it, it's like, I, do you remember the other passage? I didn't read. It's really long. <laughs> There's so many other passages. Paul's basically saying, hey, you want to you wanna, like talk culture? I can out-culture you. He's like, I, I am a Jew amongst Jews, a Pharisee amongst Pharisees, trained at the best places. Uh, you know, I, I, he's, he starts bragging. He's like, I, and he even has to say, I've become a fool. I can't believe I'm talking this way. But he's basically saying, if you want to do culture, I'll do culture with you. But I discovered it's not the way that I win people to Christ. It's not the transformative way I bring people into faith. That's in Philippians 3, uh, 2 through 11, if you want to uh, take a look at that at some point. So, uh, I think emanate can be gorgeous. <laughs> I mean, I think here in Franklin, with the uh, ethnic diversity you have and continue to be able to have, to become a place where people are mutually full of respect and love and value for each other, where you're able to hear each other's heart and then share your own and create a new normal, this could continue to be a, a lampstand, uh, a, you know, a city set on the hill as the world is saying, we don't, we, can't, we don't even mess with issues of race anymore. They, we don't understand them. We feel like we can't do it right. Nobody, there's, no, there's no compassion. It's like, no, this could be a place. And let me give you, let me give you four things that one of um, uh, my brothers at, at Bethel gave me. We were talking to him and said, hey, as, as a leadership team, 
we've been kind of quiet about this and we don't, we don't really know exactly what to say. We'd love to just hear from you. Would you educate us and tell us kind of some of the things? And, and we had some powerful conversations with our, with our uh, uh, people of color that are in our group. But one of them said, uh, we said, what do you need? And he just rattled these off, so powerful. He said, we, we need connection with you, with the leadership and each other. So as a minority at, at Bethel Church and in Reading of minority, it's like, I need connection. I need to know I have access when things unnerve me or scare me, that I can, I can ask questions, that our relationship isn't hanging by a thread. I need, to, I need connection. He said, I need representation. I need to know that how I see the world matters and that, that, it's, that it impacts the heart of this environment and that, there, that it's, you're interested in finding other leaders who look like me. That empowering leaders who look like me, like, okay. He said, we need compassion. Compassion. It's very interesting. I, you know, on a Sunday morning, right after a, you know, really intense situation happened um, uh, with uh, racial riots in one of our cities, it was, you know, uh, one of the black uh, individuals that I'm meeting with who's kind of like helping me out of my ignorance in some way. She's like, it was kind of strange that you, nobody prayed about that. And we're like, we didn't do it on purpose. We just, I don't know, we just didn't think to. She's like, yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. It is a problem. It is a problem. And, uh, and then I think her point was even more profound and a little bit weird. She, she said, uh, she said um, why wouldn't you minister to those of us that had experienced the deep grief over what had happened? Our picture of America, our own understanding of how much safety we, we have in the environment. Um, like, why wouldn't you just say, hey, if you're a person of color right now and you're having a difficult time, you're grieving, why, why wouldn't you have a stand and minister to us? And I'm like, ah, nah, nah. I'd, I would never, like, I would not even think to do that. She's like, well, you've done it for people who are suicidal, whose marriages, who need, who need, who need money, uh, people who feel like they have a torment in their sleep. Uh, people, you know, she kind of goes through the list of all the people we've asked to like, step into this position and say, I need prayer. And she's like, isn't it odd that you kind of have a... a you're afraid to, you know, call the, the brothers and sisters of color to say, hey, are you traumatized by what has happened? Can we minister to you? Like, ah, I didn't even let my brain go there. I, I just was, I guess I don't know why, I just didn't let my brain go there. Super great having a friendship, having a relationship like this. And so, as, you know, talking to her and other people, she has a good phrase. She goes, my white family thinks this about this, and my black family thinks this. And I'm like, that's a nice way of saying it. Because <laughs> she, she's got the family always in there <laughs> uh, when, she's, when she's kind of talking about, hey, this was uh, tough. Connection, representation, compassion, and education. Education. Can we continue to just learn and talk uh, about these things? Uh, we're towards the end, but I do want to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. by watching his speech from, uh, from Washington and uh, celebrate him. Is that ready to go? If you can get it ready, that'd be great. Yeah, he's like, Dan, it's late. Uh, yeah, that's it. You know, there's, a, there's an edited version, but I feel like it's good for us to hear the whole thing, if you don't mind. If you've got to run, I totally get it. But, but I, I think he's a prophet. Listen, Dr. Martin Luther King's dad went to Germany in, in the 30s and was so impressed by Martin Luther and Martin Luther's capacity to change society through ideas. In other words, the Reformation happened without a lot of bloodshed in Germany. There was some, but he was rocked by how much impact Martin Luther had as a teacher and as a reformer. And so he came home, his name is Michael King, and he said, we're gonna be no longer Michael King, we're gonna be Martin Luther King. Senior and Martin Luther King Jr. changed their names to be named after a reformer who transformed the society in kind of a bloodless revolution of ideas. Yeah! Those are people we can get behind, that we can celebrate. And there's, there's a prophetic. We think the prophet isn't just calling out the sin, but the prophet sometimes might see the sin but calls out the destiny or the gold. 
we've been teaching this for a while. It wasn't until I re-listened to this, this preach teach by an apostle prophet that I was like, oh my goodness, he was calling out the gold in America. Not ignoring its problems and the injustice, but calling out the gold. And so um, this will take focus from you. It's a little unclear. It's a little hard to hear. It's worth listening to deeply. And at the end, we'll just kind of wrap it up kind of quickly and move into ministry time, all right? So go ahead and, oh, is it me? I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And this momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, the, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. <laughs> the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time 
to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment this sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until that is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. And those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. <laughs> there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice in the process of gaining our rightful place. We must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. And the marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the vi victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. As long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. Yeah. 
No. No, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not my unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. And some of you have come from areas where your quest, quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities. Knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Yeah. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low the rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together this is our hope this is a faith that I go back to the south with with this faith we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope with this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day. 
This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring. From the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania, let freedom ring. From the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado, let freedom ring. From the curvaceous slopes of California, but not only that, let freedom ring. From Stone Mountain of Georgia, let freedom ring. From Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Prophet, apostle, believer, reformer, man of God, calling us uh, to another way. And again, it's been, what, 50 plus, almost 60 years since that. 60 years. It's, it's sad to realize also the church was not with him. The majority of the church did not like Dr. King, did not agree with him, fought against him, most every step of the way, to our grief. We could not join him in his, his call, or our, our people didn't, the church didn't. It doesn't have to stay that way, though. We can be the front of this transformative expression of love and justice and kindness and harmony. It's the call. You guys, you are beautiful. You're going to get more beautiful still as you continue to speak graciously to each other, hear each other's heart, share your heart, and create a new normal. Franklin will not be the same. Franklin will not be the same. Let me go ahead and stand and pray for you. So we've just had a prophet prophesy over America. And I just say over this, group, this company of believers, um, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you to create something you don't know how to create and to be a sort of pre people you haven't yet seen yourself as being, but you are becoming. And the word of the Lord is you are being knit together. You are being joined together. Was it Lookout Hill, Tennessee? Lookout Mountain? And so I pray, let this be a Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. Let this place, this house, be a Lookout world. Look out for what is flowing from this church and this congregation. Look out, devil, for the racism and the injustice that will be torn down. Look out for what the church of Jesus Christ will do as we express the love and the kindness, the respect, the justice, and the righteousness of Heavenly Father. We declare, uh, we, we, more than political, we will be the people of God. The people of God. I ask for great wisdom in this house, great capacity in this house, deep friendships in this house. I ask, Lord, let this be a safe place for minorities to come and to feel like that is a place where I belong. I belong. I belong. We bless this house. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Big round of applause for Dan. Thank you so much. Whew. Thank you.
Hey guys, if you would like prayer, we have an amazing ministry team. They're going to be right behind me in just a minute. Um, if you like healing, just some encouragement, prayer for anything specific, you can come over to this aisle here and Betsy will direct you to a team. Also, our School of Supernatural Life students, we are not going to be having school tomorrow because of the snow. So we will miss you guys. You guys have a phenomenal week. We love you. Bless you. Drive home safe. Stay warm. And we will see you next week. Love you guys. Bless you.